All right, I'll try to zoom through this fairly quickly. I want to honor your time and hopefully leave a few minutes for any uh, questions or discussion. This is kind of an adapted uh, presentation that I gave to the uh, combined test beds and coordinating committee uh, a couple of months back. Uh, some of you know, um, some of you may not know, the uh, Weather Ready Nation initiative established that it wanted to, uh, that in order to achieve some of the priority strategic goals, that uh, in some way on an operations and services proving ground needed to be spun up. And I spent the bulk of 2012 uh, in the process of doing that. And the, the whole idea is to create a, an environment and a space and a, a system where um, we are we are blending the, the need for uh, science and technology infusion to be uh, more efficient and streamlined, more optimized, and that we're also preparing today's forecasters to support the uh, Weather Ready Nation initiative by building capacity uh, as a science-based service organization for superior IDSS. So, you know, these are mission words. Um, we, we don't really need to spend a lot of time on, on this, but but the whole issue of advancing processes and skill sets that are going to be needed to deliver and communicate weather information, and that's that's founded on on quality science and and strong tools to uh, extract that information, to make the information available in multiple formats, so that people can develop their own uh, apps and uh, decision trees, and uh, also to um, make sure that forecasters. Uh, understand how to convert their scientific expertise into actionable risk communication messaging. Uh, and, and so we want to create a system where there's development and refinement in labs and test beds, but then there's also operational readiness evaluations that are occurring in a realistic operational setting. Uh, most of you, if not all of you, have been around long enough to remember things like um, the original version of SCAN that, you know, passed through initial sort of um, is, is this uh, cool science and interesting and maybe value added to a forecaster in a, you know, an HWT type environment? And then uh, the workload and the, the processing issues and the crashing of Warren Gen, all of that kind of stuff happened after it was already delivered into a, an actual operational setting. So we want to also not just look at whether it's value added to the decision process, uh, but also that it does not impact the human factors like workload and workflow and those kinds of things. So there are really sort of two distinctive niches. One is this, uh, uh, the, the second bullet I sort of already talked about, which is to validate operational readiness for some of these promising capabilities that are emerging from the test beds uh, or from the field, for that matter, um, as a final step to earn forecaster endorsement. And so we'll actually not just like, in, in, for instance, maybe there's something like, uh, new ensemble modeling or um, the NASA sport total lightning tool. And, uh, and it goes through the hazardous weather test bed, and it gets green lights, and the forecaster is enthusiastic about it. Well, we, we want to bring it into a setting where at, at least um, we also test, test drive it in, in a setting where forecasters are brought in, and they go through an entire production cycle. So you still have to do your grids. You still have to do your aviation forecast. You still have to create some, uh, maybe communicate with emergency managers and do a, a multimedia briefing and all of that kind of stuff. And, and as we increasingly sort of add time pressures, does this still add value without adversely impacting the, the workflow or the data flow or the work process? Um, before we would recommend it for implementation, even if it's on an experimental basis at a few actual offices. Uh, the other area, though, is that the, uh, the Proving Ground is charged with kind of a services arm, um, initiatives that, that are designed to enhance effective DSS, um, maybe more like a DSS test bed, so that the emphasis is on HWT kinds of experiments are typically Sioux and science oriented. And some of the uh, training areas that the Proving Ground uh, takes place in, uh, or, uh, or facilitates and hosts would be more in the WCM and ERS kinds of areas, like uh, at least initially providing a DSS deployment boot camp uh, for um, 
training ERSs in the kinds of activities that go on at ICS structures and, and in uh, basic uh, risk communication kinds of skill sets. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. But here's the hardware. So we have a prototype two rack AWIPS that basically provides the same performance capability, but uh, we're, we're experimenting with we're virtualized processing and some cloud architecture to um, uh, to just experiment with whether whether that might be viable for data processing. Um, how scalable is it? Can we can we bump up? You know, create a virtual server when we need more bandwidth for a particular operation, and then dial it back in quiet times. Can we uh, easily add storage? Uh, what kind of IT security issues are there? Um, and if we can achieve success in that, then we not only provide better flexibility and fewer overall data processing centers, but we lower the refresh costs in the long run, which is a kind of a presidential directive, I guess, that, uh, that we examine ways to do that for the future. Uh, and then there's a traditional five rack system that is actually being installed the week of September 16th uh, by Raytheon, and that'll be configured to facilitate these readiness evaluations because we want to make sure that those are conducted on equipment identical to what the current WFO environment looks like. Otherwise, you're not really doing a one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, there are at least 11 recommendations and two best practices. They're listed in uh, uh, slides that are um, basically supplementary backup slides, but uh, that, that are directly related to ongoing activities or projects that are in development uh, at the operations proving ground. Um, most people believe who have read through it feel like this is a good solid strategy. It makes sense, uh, but um, regardless of how the strategy looks, occasionally you have to look at how are we doing in terms of um, creating, you know, our activities actually uh, producing positive results. And so, at the end of the first year, um, here's where we are. Actually, we had a staff of five on board, but one has already left to take a full-time position with FEMA. She was a, a social scientist with um, a meteorology degree from OU, um, but a working on a PhD in risk communication and emergency management. Um, we do have a charter. It's available at testbeds.noaa.gov if you're interested in details about that. As I mentioned, we're finalizing the system configuration. Um, produced a little bit of initial support for the uh, first year of the IBW project that's uh, already ended, and we provided both technical and uh, actual forecast support for the Aviation Weather Center's uh, testbed experiment. Uh, some of you participated or are participating with Chad Gravel, who's kind of the lead scientist at the Proving Ground, in uh, exploring the fog and low, low cloud and stratus uh, goes our algorithm, and uh, that is being expanded and deployed to uh, all uh, offices from uh, representing all the regions uh, during this coming winter. Um, deployment boot camp, I'll speak uh, more to uh, very briefly in a moment. Uh, I'm, I'm also the executive producer for an emergency response specialist professional development series uh, that will be released to you, um, hopefully version one, within the next couple of months so that you can begin exploring ways to put together lesson plans and that sort of thing for uh, people who show interest in that sort of uh, career path uh, in your offices. Um, we also provided some basically programming code uh, some coding for uh, the winter hazard message simplification experiment that was an AQUIS-led uh, experiment last winter. Um, we've run a pilot weather training course for FEMA watch standards, and uh, we're about to do a second one in August, uh, which has been really successful, providing professional qualification standards and also just creating better um, partnerships, uh, personal relationships with people who stand watch and brief weather and climate to the FEMA regions. And we had at least two representatives from all from each of the 10 FEMA regions and three from FEMA headquarters here. And we're going to repeat that again. So um, I think that's a really, uh, that's got a lot of potential for helping us connect to be part of, you know, seen as important partners in the national response framework. Uh, and that's uh, really got no downside. 
Uh, and then we also issued an announcement of opportunity for labs and test beds and uh, academic institutions to submit proposals to be included in um, in the uh, in operational readiness evaluations. So let me just talk really briefly for these. Uh, I, I've kind of I may not have to really add much to any of these others. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, science is, is crucial, and so is uh, the, the process of communicating that science to people who are out there um, as core partners who are actually making life-saving decisions or important risk management decisions. And risk management is the business that our, our core partners are really in. And a lot of people say, well, what do we mean by DSS? And there's a lot of ways to slice it and dice it. This is really the most simple, straightforward way I can think about it, uh, and, and that is just to get the right information to the right people at the right time to make the right decisions. Uh, because we have spent a lot of time over the last several years um, emphasizing, we, well, uh, let, me, let me back up. We have experienced an increasing um, interest in and requests for uh, on-site or even remote from weather offices um, support for high-impact events, whether it's uh, on-site for a lengthy period of time, like we've done uh, three out of four years up in the Red River of the North or in the Missouri River Basin, where we're uh, on-site at a joint field office for weeks on end. Um, sometimes it's um, for a matter of a couple of weeks, like um, uh, me and another, and an IMET deploying to Joplin a couple of years back. Sometimes it's when you guys are doing large planned, large venue events like a, a NASCAR event or a state fair and you're just supporting from your office. It is important to understand how to plug in and communicate with uh, incident command system language and structure and decision making process. And so that whole issue of making sure we understand risk communication and we're proficient in that um, up and down the line uh, is an important aspect of being prepared to address those increasing requests for that type of support. So boot camp is something that we developed as a risk uh, in, in uh, and some of you were at the very first one to help us sort of refine what was needed. Um, but basically, we're talking about, we're addressing ICS knowledge, consistent messaging, how to focus on impacts, um, a, be adaptable in the sense of not being tied to our own um, criteria for various kinds of weather, but to connect to the vulnerabilities of the incident to make sure that we understand uh, the issues that are in the safety plan and learn to communicate in their language. Um, we're also, I'm, I'm going to start working soon on, so incident, so we, we, we do this and it's, we've done this twice and we're about to do two more next year. It's a very experiential workshop. It's, um, we, we use these onset DSS skill sets. We bring people in and, uh, and, and have them practice uh, the types of briefings, various types of briefings that we, you would do on an incident. It culminates in a full day incident simulation exercise. We film you with people who are reporters and uh, doing press interviews and provide feedback that way. And we have people who are actual incident commanders, ops chiefs, plans chiefs, providing some feedback on, on the briefings and the kind of decisions that they need to make and how weather thresholds connect to those decisions. I'm also going to start working on something that I feel like will be help us get more bang for our buck, and that is to develop a mobile boot camp where maybe about three of us go out and uh, spend about a day and a half in an office. Um, you don't get the full-blown experience of three and a half days off-site and immerse yourself in this kind of an incident, but what, you, what it makes up for, aside from lower cost, is you train with the people that are your coworkers and uh, maybe have one, one office uh, back up another and then sort of trade that off and spend a day and a half doing some training in, in DSS, in incident command system structure, in risk communication, and uh, maybe in some leadership and management training as well. Um, the P3 
PDFs, I already kind of said enough about that. There is a Google site here where you can track our progress. We're not doing it on the traditional wiki page, um, but I've got a Google site, and you're all welcome to see how that's coming along. Um, I'm not going to talk about watch warning advisory or winter simplification, um, but suffice to say we are part of uh, a support group that's trying to find better ways to um, create language that is more clear and understandable. Um, all of those really have to do with making sure that we're focusing in our communication efforts on what's important, the hazards, the impacts, and the risks. Um, the watch standards course I already talked about, and so in the interest of time, I'll skip over that. The, announce, the announcement of opportunity, um, uh, this is what it looks like, and again, it's at testbeds.noaa.gov. Uh, we did get some uh, promising proposals. Uh, NASA Sport wants to work with us on convective warning and forecast operations evaluation. Um, the GSD Hazard Services Hydrologic Warning Tool for Flood Operations, we're hoping to b pull that in for some live um, or canned weather event demos. Uh, before launching it for implementation in offices. Uh, we've already done a design and usability evaluation with a focus group of emergency managers for this enhanced data display uh, and with some FEMA watch officers as well. Um, and then we're also um, hoping to do some more social science validations and planning for the next steps of improving hazard and impact messaging. And uh, I've been working very closely with uh, Lance Rothfuss of Hazardous Weather Testbed to kind of carve out a, uh, a couple of projects where we could maybe collaborate. Uh, one is on convective initiation and the warn on forecast concept and sort of bridge the gap between watch warning and advisory and have this sort of continuous stream of information that um, uh, that that represents kind of a new paradigm in the way we might be able to communicate what we know when we know it. Um, and we both feel like if we can collaborate instead of building separate kingdoms, we might do a better service for the agency and the public. So the idea is going to be to kind of flesh out this roundabout concept where if we share resources and improve our collaborative efforts, we might, we might be more effective at infusing s and into the real world and, and that we can bubble up ideas that emerge either from labs or from the field in the real world uh, or from field tests in these pilot projects. Uh, get a team of people evaluating what's the best way to sort of test and validate these and then maximize the flow of the best ideas into operations and also make sure there's a communication loop back from operations on what needs to be refined or further developed. So that's kind of a really quick summary of where the operations proving ground is now and where it's going. And uh, I guess we're, we're at the top of the hour, but if you have, we probably have time if you have a couple of questions. I'm uh, Jeff here. Um, the NAP report talks about the lack of agility of the weather service. Are we you know, we're a big slaw, very slow to change. Um, I I really like the concept. My my fear is that this feels kind of OSIP like to me, and I'm hoping that. It, how do you think we can break free from this, the shackles of bureaucracy and quickly getting stuff? out to the field. I think, to me, the most frustrating thing on the hazardous weather test bed is all these great things that have been going on for years that still haven't seen the light of day. Um, how, how do you think this can improve that, and, and how can we avoid being a sloth? Yeah, it's a great question. and I. I guess, you know, I'm going back to, I'm not really sure if this is where we'll land on this roundabout imagery, but um, uh, so far this is kind of um, the best picture we've come up with so far. But th this is kind of intended to address that. that. You don't have to go through all of these steps to get to operations. That's the idea, that sometimes it's important to, to leave room for it to bypass. So, uh, I don't want to imply that 
first it goes, you know, through a through a lab or a test bed experiment, and then it has to go through the proving ground, and then it has to be tested in a pilot project because that would create essentially a, a proxy for the gates of OSIP where things just kind of go to die or or they take forever to get you know to get to operation. Uh, we want to create a system where the the, uh, the merits of, a, of an idea or a tool or a capability can be evaluated on where's the best way to, uh, you know, convert them uh, to find the, the quickest path to experience and operationalizing it. So uh, with, but at the same time, making sure we don't field stuff that's going to break trust when it gets there because we didn't think through how it might adversely impact the forecast process or the workflow. So um, that's primarily what Lance and I have been trying to sort out. How can we create a system that is more fluid and more flexible and that we can share resources um, so that the, the path is still, you know, as fast as possible. Um, but it is a challenge. I mean, we work for the government and so this our, our forte has traditionally not been flexibility and agility. Um, so I, you know, all I all I can say is I'm sensitive to that. I, I appreciate that, and we're hoping to develop something that will help us avoid creating another bureaucratic mess. But I guess time will tell whether that's effective. Well, I, I guess I'll just say one other thing, and that is that there we will find that sometimes the best thing to do is to actually have some field offices test something in operations, like was done with the fog and um, low cloud algorithm. And if that's the best way to do it, um, to really test its, its viability and its usability, that's probably the 